Let's pray and be, let's just get into God's word. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for what you've been teaching us already, uh, just about our gifts and the gifts you have for us. And I pray that we would just grow in a greater awareness and understanding of just your plans and purposes for our lives so that we live in a way that brings honor and glory to you and accomplishes uh, just your, your great work in this world, God. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name, amen. Well, um, you know, we are looking at uh, these gifts, and one of the things I wanted to do each and every week is kind of bring some, not just the gifts and, and kind of analyzing the gifts, but a way to apply them to our lives in the context of applying them, because quite frankly, there are all kinds of things that go along with the gifts, and so I just figured it'd be easy to break it up week by week by adding another element of that. And so today I want to point out that sometimes people teach this, and I, I, sometimes there's various opinions out there on different things, and I'm okay with that. Uh, I I tend to fall on a certain opinion, and I'll share when it's an opinion of mine. But there's some people that teach that the gifts are permanent, and that once you get a gift, it's, uh, you, you, you're not going to lose it. I tend to not really subscribe to that as much. I think there are more, sometimes gifts that are maybe more dominant in our lives than others, but they're not necessarily permanent. And here's one of the reasons why. Uh, you, you know, I, I tend to have uh, what's Many would say I have more of the gift of teaching. So uh, that is a dominant gift in my life, but there might be a day that comes when I can't teach anymore <laughs> for whatever reason. And uh, guess what? I, I just can't do it because it's, it's not permanent. It's part of who I am. It's part of who God created me. And as long as he, he helps me function in this gift, I'm going to keep doing it. But there may become a day. Some of you know this kind of happened to Billy Graham, right? He got to an age and a, a spot where he just couldn't go out and evangelize like he used to. And, and it just kind of shows you, like, guess what? Any one of these gifts were dependent upon the Holy Spirit at all times. Uh, throughout, throughout our lives to use them. So I just wanted to say that because I think sometimes we can say like, okay, this is my gift and it's for my life and we, we leave no room for anything else. Um, within that is also, I think that there are some times that God gives us a gift that's temporary in nature. And if, if all gifts are permanent, then there's no room for God to temporarily use you in a gift. And, and that's the flip side of it. And I really believe that God could temporarily use us in different gifts. Today, we're going to look at three more li- gifts. We're going to look at giving, leading, and mercy. And so uh, I was just kind of, to put it in context, maybe typically your, your go- dominant gift is maybe not that you look for needs to give to all the time, okay? And that might not be your dominant gift, but God might show you a need this week for you to meet and you need to move in that gift. It might not be your dominant gift that you just wake up breathing and living out your whole life doing, but it is a temporary gift that God gives you to operate in this week. Or another example would be leading. Like I know a lot of people who they're like, I'm not a leader, right? I'm, I don't lead. And you'd rather just kind of blend in with the group. But listen, God might put something on your heart and nobody's stepping up. And so finally you just say, fine, I'll do it. And you step into that role and you lead through a situation. And then and guess what? You go back into the crowd. <laughs> like it's not your dominant gift. And so what I think we can tend to do sometimes by sit labeling again as things being permanent or not permanent is sometimes we box God out and sometimes we box God in, right? So this is my dominant gift and it's what I operate. That's boxing God in. And boxing God out is, no, I don't operate in those things because my dominant gift's over here. And so we, we, we can either box God in or box God out. And, and really, I point us back to what we did in the very beginning, Romans chapter 12. The context of these gifts is we wake up every morning not going, how can I use my gifts? But God, I'm offering my life to you as a living sacrifice. Use me however you want. And that's our approach in, in our lives. And so I just kind of want us to keep that in context as we walk through. We're, we're again going to wrap up this list uh, in Romans chapter 12 by looking at three of these gifts. The next gift on the list that the Apostle Paul lists is the gift of giving. Look what he goes on to say in verse 8. He says, if it is giving, then give generously. So this is a spiritual gift. But what I want to point out again is that a lot of times these spiritual gifts aren't, uh, it doesn't exempt the rest of us from giving. (laughs) We are all called to be givers. And one of the reasons why we're all called to be givers is because the nature of God is that he gives. 
And we are to pattern our lives after God. You know John 3.16, I know you do. It's what? For God so loved the world that he what? He gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And so God's nature is to give. And listen, when God gave, he gave his best. He didn't hold back in any way. He gave us his best and we are called to give our best. And the reason is, is that he loves us. And I'll tell you this, love always gives. Okay, if you, there's no action behind that love, it's not really love. The, the nature of love is that it always gives. And so you're, you're going to be a giver if you love God and love people. So one of the challenges for the believer is to kind of take a biblical approach to, and learn and understand how God wants us to view our stuff. Because listen, before you got saved, your stuff was your stuff, right? I mean, it basically lived for you and you accumulated your stuff. But when you become a Christian, God wants us to take a different perspective on our stuff than most people generally have. King David knew this ultimate truth about God in relation to what we could possibly give God. Look what he says in 1 Chronicles 29, 14. He says, but who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you and we have given you only what comes from your hand. And one of the, the most important understandings that a believer has is that our stuff is not our stuff, it's God's. <laughs> Anything we have, is, it's all God's. And the best word that describes a Christian's relation to his stuff is stewardship. We are to steward God's resources in, in a way that best honors him. And this is what every believer needs to understand. It's why God instituted the tithe. Now listen, God didn't institute tithing because he needs your money. You realize that, right? It's all his. He doesn't need your money. And so why did he institute the tithe? Well, the tithe really tests our hearts. It really tests to see whether we are, are going to walk in obedience and trust God in what he says he, he wants to do in our lives. And so I think it's very important we understand that we don't give our tithe to God. We don't give it to him. <laughs> you realize that? I mean, because if it's God's and all of it's God's, then we can't give him anything, right? So is it, we, by the way, tithe just means 10%. That's what the word tithe means. And so we don't give God anything. We're returned to him a portion of what he requires. And, and we, we never really think about this, but isn't it amazing that God allows us to keep 90%? <laughs> I mean, it's all his and he allows us to keep 90% for ourselves. Now here's how God describes us though when we don't give the 10% he has required. Look what it says in Malachi 3, 8 through 9. It says, will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how, have, how are we robbing you in tithes and offerings? You are under a curse in your whole nation because you are robbing me. And quite frankly, when you look at the scripture, we, what our, we need to understand is when we don't give God the 10% he requires, we're literally stealing from him. Like there's no other way around it. And, and I love how Malachi puts it, mere mortal, <laughs> like, you're immortal and here is God and you're going to steal from God? Like that is the perspective he's wanting us to take hold of. And so when we don't give God the tithe, we are literally stealing from him. Now it's something else important to understand is what it says. If we do that, guess what? We're going to find ourselves under a curse. And I, I want to really explain why that is. It's not like God curses us. Cursed be you because you didn't tithe. <laughs> it doesn't, it's not like he's pronouncing a curse on us. What we have to understand is this. When we tithe, we actually come under the blessing and protection of God. Like that is what God says. When you tithe, when you honor me with your tithe, I'm going to protect and bless you. When you don't do that, you come out from under his protection and under, uh, under his blessing for your life, literally. And you know what's left when you come out from under that? The curse. This world has been cursed because sin entered the world. And so the only thing left for us to live in then is the curse. And so actually by us tithing, by us coming under God's blessing, we get to experience life away from the curse because of God's blessing in our lives. And this is what tithing really positions us for. We all want God's blessings. I, I never met a person that says, I don't want to be blessed by God. The problem is, is that we don't always want to trust and obey what God has said it takes to be under his blessing. There, there's where the rub is. 
The tithe is a per- perfect example that reveals this. But look what happens when we actually stop robbing God. Look what it says in verse 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. Listen, there's two things I want to point out. It says bring the whole tithe. And part of the reason why it said that is because I don't know why Christians feel like they can just tip God. (laughs) Like they don't have to bring it all. Like, okay, God, I'll give you 2% and think that he's going to be happy with that. Because listen, when is it in a disciple's life to be okay just to give God a portion of what he requires? You think God's okay with saying, well, okay, well, I'm only going to give you 10% of my life, God, but I'll live 90% for myself. And God's going to be like, oh, I'm so proud of you. No, God wants 100%. That's the type of God he is. And so he says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. That means do it full out. Obey me and do this. And it's the only place he says to test me. So test me in this and see if I'm not going to be faithful and true to bless you. Listen, Carrie and I both tithes our whole lives. We've been fortunate to grow up in households where our parents taught us this uh, principle from an early age. Uh, Levi and Hannah have already tithed and they're six and four, okay? So we're teaching it to our kids as well. And I'm not, I could tell you this, we've experienced hardships just like everyone else. But generally speaking, if we look back at the whole of our entire lives, we've seen God's incredible faithfulness and we have been blessed beyond our wildest imagination because we've been just honoring God and faithful with what he's told us to do. On top of that, honestly, any person that I've ever met who's been like a lifetime tither, when I say lifetime tither, like the moment they knew like this was required of God, they started doing it and they never looked back, they have no regrets. Like they totally get it and they totally understand that tithing is a principle that honors God and God, you can never outgive him. He will always take care of you. And so I don't know anybody who regrets it. And that should teach anybody who's even willing to go, okay, God, I'm going to test you in this to be willing to do that. Listen, I'm teaching this not because um, anything except simply this. I want you to understand your position in God and be right with him. And, And your understanding of tithing and giving is connected to that because God says if you don't do this, you're under a curse. That, that doesn't mean like the moment you realize you should do it, you're under a curse. No, you're under a curse, but you are, God's trying to awaken you to understand how to get out from under that curse. And it starts with honoring God and realizing that all of it's his and I'm a steward of it and I'm going to start by honoring him with the 10% he requires. And so all of us are to be givers. But then there is people who are gifted to be more like super givers <laughs> like they are just they, they've been wired to look for needs and meet them and, and this is pretty pretty quite awesome when you see these people listen to be a giver the word give literally means to give a share or in part in other words like you see what you have and look for opportunities to share with whatever god has given you and it says to do this generously And that word generously in the Greek is an interesting word because it actually means generously and with simplicity. And so it seems like those don't go together, but it's one of those words that's more of a compound word. And the word picture is really this, that we really are willing to give as much as possible and with no strings attached with simplicity. Like, I, I'm just willing to give it. I'm not trying to manipulate you. I'm just, I just want to bless you. I just want to help you. And I want to encourage you. And so those who have this gift, though, are not always rich. <laughs> okay, this has nothing to do with how much money you have. In fact, some of the people who are the most generous givers I know don't have a lot. In fact, I really believe it's because they don't have a lot that they understand what it means to share with those who need something as well because they've been willing to be on the receiving end of receiving from somebody. But they are just willing to say, God, I look at my resources and whatever I have, I'm willing to let you use it to bless somebody else through me. A great example of this gift in action is the Macedonian church. In 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 4, Uh, We read this, and now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. 
in the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. And they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. Listen, here you have a group of people who are living in extreme poverty. That's what it says. Like they don't have much means or much resources. And yet they're begging for the opportunity to give to the work of God. Like this is how serious they want to be a part of God's work is they're willing to sacrifice even out of their extreme poverty. And so the people with this spiritual gift, again, they are looking, they don't need to be begged to give. They need to see a need and want to meet it, and they are willing to do whatever they can to, to really do that. People with this gift are, are wonderful people to be around. I mean, we often describe them as somebody who's willing to give the shirt off their back, right? I mean, like that's a, an accolade that we really appreciate, people like that who are willing to do that. And I, I really love that our church is a giving church. I mean, really, our church has an incredible heart to give. Let me give you two examples. One is, um, we were talking about this uh, with Tiffany and Tamela earlier in the first service, and that is, is like the food that we have ready to go for people. Um, we've never really made too many pleas for people to bring in food, and yet, at week after week, it's getting replenished. People just see and bring in food and stock it back up. And so uh, th- we've never really made a bunch of pleas for people to bring in food, and yet you see the need and you're doing it. Last year, we had a, an incredible opportunity to partner with a church in Kenya because they didn't have clean water. And so we, we raised in literally two weeks $4,000 to build them this well. And now... Listen to this. Now over 30 families are getting fresh water uh, each week from this well. And it's because many people in our church sacrificed. And listen, last year was not the greatest year for, for many of us, like financially. I know it wasn't, okay? It was a struggle because of COVID and people not working and things like that. And yet in two weeks' time, we raised $4,000 so that we could do this. And that was because people sacrificed. They, were, they saw a need. They were willing to sacrifice and give to that need. And God is being glorified because of it. Listen, not only are they giving water, but they're also sharing the living water and using it as an opportunity to minister to their community. It's such a great thing, and and I'm just very proud of our church for stepping into that. But this is because God has given us a heart to give. He's given us the spiritual gift. And so as as we go throughout the week, I just want you to be open to looking around and seeing needs around you. And maybe you see a need and you're simply like, okay, God, I can meet that need and then step in and do it. Just like we said with serving, do it in Jesus' name, okay? Do it in a way that God gets the honor and glory, not that someone just goes, well, thank you for giving me 20 bucks. Like, then you're getting, it's all about you, right? So do it in such a way that it becomes about God and the work that he is wanting to do to meet somebody else's need. And that's when it's a spiritual gift. The second gift we're going to look at today is the gift of leadership. And Paul says this, if it is to lead, do it diligently, And the Greek word for leadership is a word picture basically of somebody who stands up in front of a group of people. That's it. (laughs) That's what leadership tends to be, okay? And so uh, it's interesting, though, that the eight times that this word is used in the New Testament is always used in connection to serving and caring for other people's needs. And so what we, we need to just kind of say up front is, is the spiritual gift of leadership is way different than the worldly leadership we see around us today. It's vastly different. And yet, I know many of us have experienced bad leaders in our lives. Like in the world, there's people that have been bad leaders, and unfortunately, there's been bad leaders in the church that some of us have experienced. And the reason why you may have experienced bad leadership in the church is because when the church tries to do leadership like the world does it, it's going to mess it up. And God has created leadership in a spiritual dimension to be more than authority over people, or getting people just to do a task for you. 
people exercising in world leadership, they, they tend to tell you what to do and you serve them, right? That's, that's what worldly leadership does. That shouldn't be what you see modeled in the church with church leadership. The Bible elevates the nature of shepherd as the model of leadership that we would see and understand. And listen, for a shepherd, they, they don't force their will on the sheep. They tend and care for the sheep, and the sheep willingly follow. That's how shepherds work. Jesus says this about himself in John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And so what Jesus does is he's laying down his life for the sheep, and that's why people follow him when they recognize all that he's done for them. And that's really what God has called leadership in the church to look like, is somebody who's willing to lay down their life for the sake of others. To add some more depth to this, let's take a look at Jesus and what he said elsewhere. It's interesting because all throughout the disciples' lives, they're, they're, they're constantly wanting to be in positions of authority. And they're fighting over it. And even up to the last day when they're having the last supper with Jesus, they break out into dis a dispute of who's going to be the greatest. And it's really quite fascinating that Jesus doesn't rebuke them because they want to be great. But he simply redefines what greatness means and how to do it. Look what he says in Luke 22, 26 through 27. He says, Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. And basically, he makes very clear that leadership is not about the person who has authority. And it's also not about the person who has separated themselves. What do you see in the world, right? Somebody who is a leader, they're up there in that corner office. You never get to talk to them. You never get to see them. They're separate from the general people, right? But Jesus says, no, here's what real leadership is. It's one that is who serves among the people, not separate from the people. It's right in the middle, serving among the people. And so leadership, the spiritual gift, is all about serving. And of course, there's a little bit more to that, and we're going to discuss that here in a moment. But I, I want you to understand that the work of God depends upon leaders. You may never really look at yourself as a leader, but I want you to think about this, because maybe you're more of a leader than you realize. Because leaders lead people to God. And if you're ever trying to lead somebody in a closer relationship with God, you've stepped into the role of leadership. Leaders help people, and they lead other people to both use and discover their gifts. Leaders help do that. Leaders lead others to serve. Whenever there's an opportunity to serve around you, there's probably other leaders who are started off serving and you're joining what they were doing and serving. And the church functions under leadership. God designed leadership to, to be part of the church. And so he has this plan and this, this design. Leaders are told to lead diligently. It means like they're not, they don't have to be motivated. Like they're not lazy. They're just diligently about the work of doing what God has called them to do. And so uh, this is why in the church, guess what? <laughs> you should nev leaders never have to be begged to do something. If you have to be begged to step into a position and do something, then you're, you're not the right person for the job because leaders never have to be begged. In fact, you know, what really needs to happen is, is if um, leaders, they just jump in and start serving long before they get a title. And maybe the title comes, maybe it doesn't. But leaders don't care. They just want to serve. They're just going to take the, take the reins. Let me show you two important things that leaders do that we find tucked away in the Old Testament. It's found in First Chronicles 12. And in this, in this uh, chapter, David is listing out his men. And it's, it's uh, this tucked away verse in verse 32. It says this, From Isaacar, men who understand the times and knew what Israel should do. And we could easily overlook that and miss the context, but let me tell you what is going on here. Listen, first of all, leaders understand the times. They understand the times that we're living in, and they have the insight to see what God is doing, like right now. So they see opportunities when everyone else is seeing just problems. <laughs> and I don't know, it's really easy to look around and see all the problems, especially in the world we live in, right? Right? 
And, and you just see problem, 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 problem. And you can get bogged down by that. But leaders step in and they don't see the problem as much as they see the opportunity that God is doing in the midst of the times we're living in. And we need this desperately today. We need people who can see what is going on and what God wants to do about it. In David's time, the men of Isaacar, they saw like the pendulum was swinging from Saul to David. And they understood like God was going to be removing Saul from the kingship and David was going to be the next king. And so the leaders not only understand the times, but they know what the people of God should do in light of it. And so the, the men of Isaacar were the first people to jump on board with David and to say, okay, we're going to serve you. And they were there ahead of time. While the rest of the nation didn't know much about David yet or that he was going to be God's man. We need leadership because too often we're stuck in what is going on now or in the past. And so we're to look back at the good old days and what we need is leaders who will see what God wants to do today and what he wants to do in the future. And so leaders step in and they kind of paint a picture of that. Maybe God shows you what, what could be. He's given you a picture of what could be and you understand the times we live in and the opportunities that are before us. You may just have the gift of leadership if you're seeing things like that. And listen, it's really how new ministries in the church start because they're desperately needed and they happen because people see an incredible need, they see a problem, they know that God wants to fix that problem and they're willing to step in and serve and lead anybody else that wants to help them fix that problem. And I just want you to know that, like, seriously, if there's anybody who sees a problem and wants to do something about it in the church, I will do whatever I can to help you, you know, start a new ministry. Because they're greatly needed. And the opportunities are boundless before us. And honestly, for many of you, if, you would, if somebody would just step up and lead something, there are probably four or five other people that are ready in the wings just waiting to follow your lead and help you serve to get the job done. Because that's the way the body works. But leadership is incredibly needed in the church. The last gift we're going to look at is the gift of mercy. And verse 8 goes on to say, If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Once again, every single believer is to show mercy. I mean, that, it's required of us. It's not like you can be like, oh, okay, I'm, uh, <laughs> I just don't feel like showing mercy today, so I don't like people. <laughs> and that's okay. I can just, it's not my gift, you know? Like, no, you don't get to claim that. This is every one of us needs to extend mercy. In fact, the Good Samaritan is an incredible story that kind of paints that picture. Most of you know the, the story. It's, you know, the guy's going down to Jericho, from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he gets beat up by some robbers and left on the roadside to die. And what do we see? We see a priest and a Levite come by, and they don't want anything to do with it. So they cross on the other side of the road. They have no mercy. They don't want to help. Then a Samaritan comes by and sees the person in need and binds up the person's wounds and takes care of them and shows mercy on him. And Jesus is telling this parable because, you know, a ruler asks him, a ruler of the law asks him, who's my neighbor? He wants to justify himself. And so in Luke 10, 36 through 37, Jesus says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. And the purpose of the parable that Jesus was telling is not so that you can identify who's my neighbor. It's actually go and do likewise. I want you to show mercy to those around you who need mercy. And again, we all want mercy and we all need to show mercy to others around us in the, this life. But there are just some people that are just wired to be mercy givers. I mean, oftentimes, they don't even go looking to show mercy. Mercy comes finding them. <laughs> They're the people who are like, you know, it's like on their forehead is, is written, share all your problems with me, I'll listen. <laughs> and so they're in Walmart and listen, somebody comes up and just dumps on them and they're, they're sharing Jesus with them for a half hour, right? And, and you're like, that never happens to me. Well, you probably don't have that gift of mercy, but that person does. <laughs> and so they have a sign, like God just attracts like a magnet people to them who will share with them. Listen, the gift of mercy is really about compassion for those in need. 
But it's a little bit more than that. It's compassion with action. Like you really see a need and you want to meet it. Because I want to tell you this. If you just have, feel compassion for someone and do nothing, you're really uncompassionate. You don't, you don't have compassion, okay? You may feel compassion, but you're not showing compassion at all. So compassion and the gift of mercy is compassion that acts. And so the person with this gift is told, do it cheerfully. Why are they told to do it cheerfully? Well, quite frankly, the people you're going to are not happy people right now. They're, they're going through incredible problems. They feel like uh, the weight of the world is on them. And so if you go in and you're kind of miserable and they're miserable, you're not going to help them, right? So God says, do this cheerfully. The person who has mercy is filled with the joy of the Lord as they do this. Listen, this gift is greatly needed today because there's hurting people all around us. I mean, they're everywhere. And where do we say that the gifts are primarily function first off in the church, right? And I want you to understand that there are people in the church every single time we meet that are hurting. They may have a smile on their face and be putting a good front up right now, but there are people next to us week in, week out who are genuinely hurting. Maybe someone here today is, is just under the weight of depression like you made it, you dragged yourself out of bed, you're here, but, but man, you just are, feel like darkness is suffocating you. Or, or maybe you're just carrying a burden that's, it just feels like it's gonna just completely collapse on you. And it's too heavy for you to keep going. There's, there might be somebody here today who's struggling with drugs or alcohol or maybe even gambling and you're under this weight of an addiction, or maybe it's even pornography. And, and there's these real people who are hurting under these weights that are in our midst. Maybe you're struggling with marriage problems today. And it's just, you're, you're just struggling to hold things together. Or maybe it's, you're struggling with one of your kids. The fact of the matter is, is that even in church, there are people we're sitting next to that are carrying incredible hurts and struggles in their lives day in and day out. And God never wants them to be alone. The gift of mercy comes in without judgment, right? And is willing to walk alongside that person, to listen to that person, to help that person any way they can, to show compassion on that person for what they're struggling with and going through. And they're willing to help them get through it. And it's incredibly needed today. A great example of this is a guy in the New Testament, and I'm probably going to pronounce his name wrong, but it's Onesiphorus. <laughs> it's a big name. And Paul is in jail in Rome, and it's, it's really in jail for his final time because he's going to be executed in a short time. And it seems like the Christians around have literally separated themselves from Paul and forgotten him. Look what it says in 2 Timothy 1, 16 through 18. It says, May the Lord show mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. May the Lord grant that, that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. You, you know very well in how many ways he helped me in Ephesus. And so I want you to see what this gifting does. I mean, here Paul is, He's alone and he's feeling isolated and he feels the weight of the world on him. And here's Onesiphorus and he, he just, he literally is searching all of the town for him so that he can go and minister to him, so that he can go and encourage him. He, everyone else has abandoned Paul and has run away from him and he runs towards this guy to be an encouragement to him. And Paul is so blessed by this that he prays that God would bless him and his whole household with the mercy they need. And I just think like, man, the world around us is so hurting and in need of the body of Christ who will, instead of running away from their hurts, instead of running away from their problems, instead of looking upon them with judgment, will run towards them with the mercy of God and be willing to listen to them and help them through what they're going through and point them to Jesus, willing to pray for somebody. I mean, willing to step into somebody else's mess without judgment. And this is, what, this is what God gifts some people to do. And I think it's 
probably a gift that is more widely distributed than, than most of us really realize. And so if God shows you an opportunity this week where somebody's hurting or somebody just starts sharing with you their problems, don't go, well, that's not my gift of mercy. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> Step into it and go, God, how are you going to use me to walk through this pain with this person right now, to point them to you, to lead them to the mercy you have for their lives? Which leads me to our closing. It's really important that we understand mercy is something every single one of us needs. And yet the good news of the cross is that God, he extended that mercy towards us. See, the bad news is this. Romans uh, 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the fact is that every one of us are sinners. And what does sin mean? It means that we're in we're in need of judgment. We're, we're prime. Like that's, that's what we deserve is judgment. Mercy comes in and doesn't give us what we deserve. It gives us something else. And so God takes on our judgment through Jesus on the cross. And because of our sins, Jesus had to die on the cross. Because he did, we can have the mercy that we need. And so in 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. And he was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. And it's because of what Jesus did on the cross for our sins that we can actually receive mercy. But what I want you to understand is that mercy is an automatic. It has to be received. 1 Peter 2.10 says, Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. In other words, once you, you weren't connected to God, right? Why? Look what it says. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And it's amazing to me how many people reject the mercy of God. But the truth of the matter is, is that mercy is offered to us, but it has to be received. And when it's received, something incredible happens. God transforms our lives. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. Every single one of us who has ever received the mercy of God, we got a new life. Jesus described it once as being born again, right? We're completely given a fresh new start on life because of the mercy of God that we've received. And it's something that the world around us needs to hear and know. And we need to point people to the mercy of God every opportunity that we can. And we've been partakers of that mercy ourselves. But others around us need to hear this incredible good news because they're in need of God's mercy themselves. Would you bow your heads? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for your scriptures and what you've taught us today. I pray that you would stir up the gifts in our, in our church body, God, in our lives personally, Jesus. God, today, may we be willing, God, to look at our lives and to really see the times that you're calling us to give and meet a need around us, Jesus. God, help us to view our resources as everything is yours in the first place, God. And so if you bring to my attention a need that I need to meet, then I have no excuse than to take the resources you've given me and, and to meet that need. And I just pray that more and more of us would walk in that gifting this week, Jesus. God, I pray for those of us who, Lord, this week we realize you've shown us a vision of what can be a way that a problem can be solved. And you've really calling us to some type of leadership, God. I pray instead of running from it, may you, may you help us step into that, God. And realize that if you're calling us to lead something, you're going to bring the other people around us that would serve with us, God. God, I pray for many opportunities this week to show mercy to people who are hurting and in need. I thank you that, God, you, Lord, took our judgment upon yourself. Lord, if it's true that 
God, we can't earn our righteousness. Help us to view other people through that same lens. It really doesn't matter what they've done, what they've gone through. What matters is if they receive your gift of mercy, God. And so I pray that we would have opportunities to lead people to your mercy, God, and to be in awe of your mercy even more through that.